So we've all seen the marketing, the blogs, the videos that tell you about the amazing modern architecture. And if you're not using the most advanced, hyper, ultra scaling, stratospheric cloud, island, lake mansion running on optimized and cabulated processing, or even a data engineer, but your data architecture can be best described as a tornado of bubble gum and beach balls. So what's more common? Let's start with the cloud. Yes, cloud data warehouses or lakes or lake houses, however they brand it, are the most flexible, powerful, and feature-rich options available to you. But that doesn't mean everyone needs one. There are lots of small or mid-sized places that could use a cloud database like Azure SQL or Postgres on AWS as a data warehouse, or using S3 or Azure Data Lake. Doing this can give you some of the cloud benefits, but makes better use of a smaller overall data footprint, where you might not get the value of the features of the full analytics platforms. For example, scaling on demand is one of the biggest features of a cloud data platform, but if the lowest compute level meets your needs, that's not a very useful feature. When I'm building something new, I usually start this way, with a cheaper and easier option, and then can upgrade to the larger data platforms after the value is proven and the stakeholders are willing to commit the budget and resources. And while I'm personally a big fan of cloud options, there's still a lot of organizations with significant on-premise infrastructure, servers, and operational expertise. And if these assets are available, cloud options may make less sense as you're not going to get as much value for the cost. It's easier to use what you already have. And you can always mix it up, perhaps you use an on-premise data warehouse, but cloud ETL tools. When it comes to architectural theory, data mesh is the hot topic. A decentralized, federated organizational data strategy creating data microservices for self-sufficient data product teams. In an ideal world, all of this sounds great, and I'm sure there's a handful of highly data and tech literate companies that can pull this off. But for the rest of us, I'm a bit skeptical. Few places I've been have anything resembling data governance and the rest were just chaos. Convincing departments like HR, marketing and customer service that they have a data product, which they need to manage, export and oversee would be an impossible task. Then they would need to hire an analyst and data professionals to handle their data product and even if you accomplish all of this, you still need governance to keep all of these departments with their own data teams, processes, and budgets on the same page. Pretty lofty goals when I consider that most places I worked for were lucky if we can get stakeholders to sit down to even consider a data strategy. But what about data models? Surely the Kimball Data Warehouse is a standard at least. Well, it is, despite a few new designs rising up. But even then, if I consider the dozen or so places I've worked doing a Kimball Data Warehouse, I don't think any of them followed best practices outlined in the toolkit. There were always trade-offs or niche use cases or just times where we had to take shortcuts that deviated, sometimes significantly, from the Kimball model. Honestly, it's sometimes crazy when you look at a supposed dimensional data warehouse and you can barely identify facts and dimensions. And then there's data engineering. First debate is going to be Python or SQL, ETL or ELT. Do you use tools or do you just write scripts and use Airflow? You can pretty easily find real world cases for all of these different options. And everyone will argue that theirs is the right one. So these are all pretty viable options depending on your skill sets, budgets, and use cases. So if you need to architect a data solution, how do you get it right? Easy, you don't. While some consultants might try to convince you that they can roll in, design an architecture, and leave with it finished in a few months, they're not going to. Architecture is something that evolves over time like any software. You should just focus on solving one business problem at a time. The first step and often the most overlooked skill of any architect is people skills and stakeholder management. Your biggest job is getting people to describe their actual business challenges and then working with them to determine the architecture that's going to solve these. And then you're probably going to rip all that apart because there isn't the budget. So you're just going to try to solve as many problems as you can with some sort of discount Frankenstein architecture. And hopefully over time, that's going to be built and developed into that ideal state you originally thought of. But it's not just charm and project management, because while picking SQL or Python or Java or whatever is a viable option, having bad code is not. The second step is ensuring there are processes around code and pipelines. Having high quality is much more important than whether you use Spark or SQL or tools or not. 
And the third thing is to break down black boxes as you find them. Having some code or processes that just works and nobody knows why or what it does is inevitable. Every system has them, but you don't want them to become the standard. So when you come across them, make sure time is set aside to break them down, rebuild them, or do whatever you need to do in order to understand what's going on. Because if you don't, this is how architectures stagnate. You can't improve things if nobody knows how it works. So keep things clear and simple. So when it's time to move from a database to a cloud warehouse platform or an ETL tool to Python or a dimensional model to one big table, it's not an overwhelming task because nobody knows how to deal with it. If you wanna know what a modern architecture looks like so you have an idea of where to work towards, be sure to check out this video next.